Hello, YouTube. Tonight on Fully Endorsed, Marvel's Falcon and the Winter Soldier. They went woke, but did they go broke? Let's discuss. With me, as always, <laughs> with me, as always, is uh, Andres Perez, a.k.a. Kaiju Noir. Hello, people of the internet, and welcome to episode 32 of Fully Endorsed. Indeed. And as I just mentioned, we are talking about the Falcon and the Winter Soldier. I promise that after this episode, we will not be talking about Marvel for a while. <laughs> At least until Loki is finished. Yes, <laughs> on the next time on MCU. Okay, I'll stop. Virginia was acting to Mickey. Anyway, uh, it's, uh... <laughs> defeating a sandwich only makes it tastier. Indeed, as we all learned. Uh, but yes, Falcon and the Winter Soldier. This is, um, of course, in the tradition of the Captain America trilogy, uh, with such films as the Captain America, the Winter Soldier, and um, Wait, Civil what? War. Oh, this, yes. this is a, this is another sort of political thriller slash action film uh, stretched out over six episodes. It's, it's very much in that same vein. Uh, so, uh, we'll, we'll, uh, let's just hop right into it, shall we? What were your general, very general thoughts on Falcon and the Winter Soldier? I will say that as a fan of the MCU, I want to say that perhaps my favorite movies within this collection, within this franchise or this collection of films would definitely be the Captain America trilogy. And so I was definitely more excited for Falcon and the Winter Soldier more so than any other post Endgame content. And I was very happy to say that the Falcon and the Winter Soldier was a very worthy follow-up to the Captain America trilogy and very much falls in line with the political espionage action thriller vibes and tone and style of that trilogy. More so Winter Soldier and Civil War than, um, than uh, the first Avenger. The first Avenger was more so of a sort of like retro, like Rocketeer-esque uh, style superhero movie, which I believe was, made, it was directed by the same dude. I think Joe Johnston was it? Um, yes, yes, yeah. he directed that and then the Russo brothers did the they'll other two right right and this definitely feels like they were taking a lot of notes from the russo brothers captain america movies and as you pointed out to me as we were watching this movie they made several um big homages uh kind of like uh, yeah homages and recreate sort of like a recre recreations of certain shots from those films from all the mcu films that they have done that the russo brothers have done uh, but yeah, for, uh, mostly Civil War. They did several. They mirrored several shots from Civil War, and um, right. There was also one from First Avenger that I noticed pretty heavily. Uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, how about you? What were your general thoughts on Falcon and Winter Soldier? Same as you, the Captain America trilogy is definitely the strongest portion of the MCU, in my opinion. I'm a big Cap guy, big fan, um, and so I was also very excited for this. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think this absolutely lived up to, um, to to what I was hoping it would be, and uh, you know, even managed to throw in some surprises, some some deep comic pull stuff in here that I never would have imagined in a million years that we would get on screen. Um, and so this is, uh, yeah, I, th I think this absolutely worked. I think it was a worthy follow up, not just to the to the Captain America films, but also a, a, a huge. A worthy follow-up to um, to WandaVision. I mean, they had a tough act to follow, uh, premiering just two weeks after WandaVision's finale, um, and that show had had gotten so much much buzz and was so you know popular. And you know, if they had screwed up, it would have been a problem. Uh, but um, the, the first episode of Falcon and the Winter Soldier was the uh, the most viewed premiere that Disney Plus has ever had so far, and so. Uh, Mm -hmm. And it carried a lot of that momentum throughout the, the whole six weeks. So they, they really managed to pull it out. Yeah, and it definitely was a very big, it, like WandaVision itself made a huge splash on the internet. Like pretty much everyone, uh, everyone was talking about that series. And so 
having to follow up on a success as big as WandaVision, you, they really had to pull out all the stops. And I feel like going this route was definitely the right call. Whereas with WandaVision, as a fun and imaginative as it was, you can tell that they were very, playing it rather safe by going in a route that allowed itself to not be too special effects heavy, just only because a lot of it is filmed in very limited sets, uh, sets or set pieces. Uh, whereas with Falcon and Winter Soldier, they're definitely going for a much more uh, expensive looking uh, action films, uh, action film pro type project. And so there's like various locations, numerous action piece, uh, you know, fight scenes, uh, a lot of twists and turns. So I would say like Falcon and Winter Soldier on a it's 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 both both Disney Plus series are very ambitious with what they were setting out to do. But I feel like Falcon and Winter Soldier is perhaps like on a technical scale, perhaps more of a challenge than what than WandaVision. And in that case, I feel like it was Here's what else. Yeah. To your point, I don't know if it's necessarily more challenging, but it's a very different kind of challenge uh, because the Falcon and the Winter Soldier is going for like a big cinematic type story, oh. whereas WandaVision was very intentionally until the you know final two episodes, very intentionally aping television. Yeah. Um, and, you know, don't let it fool you. Recreating, you know, those time periods is a very expensive thing to do. You have to, you know, oh, I'm sure. Power. Yeah costuming and sets design and all that i mean camera it eats work. Up a, yeah camera work all that it, it eats up a lot of dough that is um, true yeah and the fact that, like as you mentioned to me before they actually had to bring in old school uh cinematographers and special effects people uh people from those eras to teach the new guys how to recreate that st those styles right so um yeah um whereas one division is is very intentionally uh made to feel like television mm -hmm. uh, this is more like you're watching a six-part movie a miniseries essentially yeah yeah uh, and so it's 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 just got more of a a scope more of a scope more of a cinematic right uh, right and feel and i guess for people who are in who are desperately looking for that classic mcu cinematic scope and had fun. I'm sure there's a lot of people who had fun with WandaVision, but were hoping for a more return to form with that style, that scope, as you were mentioning before. Falcon Winter Soldier certainly brought it to the table here. Absolutely, absolutely, I would and agree. I do gotta say, this is definitely one the show that that really solidified the sort, no, really not solidified so much, but like blurred the lines between movies and television where at this point it's hard to even tell the difference anymore you had stuff like a game of thrones and breaking bad that felt like movies but in a televised format and this yeah. one really raised the bar even further and uh, as much as i love shows like daredevil and jessica jones and to an and to a slightly lesser extent um luke cage these newer Disney shows so far has really blown the ma the majority of the Netflix stuff out of the water. Well, one thing that they've been doing that I think is very smart is that they've been keeping the same director over the duration of the series. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, every episode of WandaVision was directed by Matt Shackman, and every episode of Falcon and the Soldier is directed by, I forget uh, her name. Carrie, Carrie Scogland. Thank you. Yes, Carrie Scogland. Or Carrie, um, I could be wrong. And that's huge because normally in television, you know, you you, you 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 might come in and direct the pilot, in which case you get to set the tone, and then you're off. And that's you know, and they might they might bring back regular directors every now and then, but by having one person shepherd the entire show from beginning to end, it allows it to feel so much more cohesive. It allows it to feel much more like one, you know, um, person's vision. Very true. Yeah. Um, do you know why they often change directors in television? Is is it because it's just too much work for one person to do alone? Um, I mean, probably that was probably the reasoning behind it. Um, especially because you know, normally a season of television is much longer mm -hmm. than than this. I mean, these Disney Plus shows. The other thing they're doing, which is really smart, is that they're they're condensing their number of episodes. You right. Know, they're only. Um, 
Go ahead. Only nine episodes for WandaVision, uh, and then six episodes for Falcon and the Winter Soldier, although the six episodes are um, longer than the WandaVision episodes, so it probably evens out uh, roughly. Um, that is true. So, and yeah, like- I, I think that was probably the uh, the idea, mm-hmm. is that... Uh, you, know, you you can't have one guy direct 22 <laughs> episodes a year he would right. <laughs> he probably he shoot would just, himself he would just die from exhaustion yeah imagine like having to work on the set of like freaking uh what, what was it what, what was the show with Mary Kate and Ashley uh, full house, like, full house. Yes, I got. I was thinking family matters. He's like, no. I was like, yeah, full house. Imagine like having to direct the same like sappy like uh, talk scenes with, 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 uh, over and over again between Bob Saget like, and his daughters. I feel like I only I would only get like five episodes in before I threw myself out a window. That's <laughs> it's just too much, man. <laughs> ah, I see what you did there. Uh. What, what was it? Uh, oh yeah, and yeah, I'm so glad they they're not doing. They didn't do what the net, what net the Netflix Marvel shows did, where they were like stretching out their plots to fill out a 12 episode quota. Or yeah, because I, I feel like in for and in Netflix's defense, you know, mm. streaming series were still a relatively new thing yeah. when they were doing Daredevil and and you know all those shows. True. And I, and I think they still felt like they needed to conform to like the old television formats for whatever reason. And so they thought, well, you know, a, uh, a standard season of television is like minimum, like usually like 13 episodes. And so they felt like they needed to uh, stretch their stories out to that length. That, you know, you definitely raise a good point there. And it's kind of an interesting, it, even though like the Marvel Netflix shows, they're not that old. And yet you can already say that they are a product of their time which is kind of frightening to think about how fast and how quickly things are changing in the entertainment landscape. Well, streaming is a brave new frontier. And whenever you have a new uh, form of, of media, a new form of entertainment like this, uh, the early evolution goes by very quickly because people are figuring out what works for this medium. And, uh, you know, in the beginning, we were just sort of aping what had worked before, but it, it, you know, it doesn't always work as well under the new model. And so they have to make adjustments. And now we're at this point where it's like, we'll, we will make this as long as it needs to be to tell the story. And that's absolutely, I think, the right way to go about it. Yeah. And uh, I guess in terms of like of a, of a productions uh, from a production angle, I was really surprised by how well they were able to put together this entire series in the middle of the pandemic. So like apparently filming began in October 2019, according to the Wikipedia article in Atlanta, Georgia, before moving to the Czech Republic in March 2020. Um, eventually yes. production was halted because of the pandemic. And uh, eventually they were able to wrap up all of the wrap up filming in last October. So pretty much from October 2019 to October 2020, they were able to complete this entire series. So this is honestly probably like, I know like, what was it? Uh, Black The Black Widow movie was finished well before the pandemic. But this was like, I guess our first uh, piece of MCU content perhaps that was filmed during the pandemic and so beyond I feel like um i think time because this originally was supposed to come out first yeah i think timeline wise at least some of one division must have been filmed during the pandemic hmm. but most of that was on sets so that's less of a problem you can control that a lot better you know you get tom cruise at the door making sure everybody's <laughs> doing what they're supposed to be doing yeah uh but um or heck you can you can throw in christian bale if you want for a good measure the big problem with Falcon and the Winter Soldier is that they were dealing with location shooting mm-hmm. and location shooting in a foreign country. A foreign country, by the way, which did not have as high of a COVID rate as we did at the time mm-hmm. and was and was very wary about letting, you know, this American production back in. Yeah. And so, you know, that was a you know, Marvel had to negotiate that. And uh, it was a, a complex thing that they had to work around. And this was after they had they had already ran into issues even before the pandemic because they had originally planned to film some of the location stuff in Puerto Rico and they wound up having to uh, not go there because of the earthquakes and instead they uh, they found some locations in the Czech Republic to work with so um, a, lot, a lot of things were moved around in that regard and so this was in comparison to WandaVision this was definitely a very um, 
troubled production, as, as uh, at least during the shooting phase. Right. Uh, so much so that it there is a fan theory going around, which we'll get into later, that may have potentially have changed the entire, like a good chunk of the story, uh, in terms of the villains and their motivations. Yeah, and I don't know if I buy it, but uh, it's interesting. It's an interesting theory. Um, yeah, yeah. A lot of people have been saying it, stating it as if it's fact, and I haven't seen any confirmation from. Feige or anybody else at Marvel that this is indeed true. Uh, but, I, guess, uh, I guess we won't find out until these type of shows are eventually released on DVD or whatever and they put out like director commentaries and whatnot. Which hopefully they do at some point. They still haven't released Mandalorian on any kind of home right. media. Have they ever released any of the Marvel Netflix shows? At least in, at yeah, least in America. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I'm pretty sure Netflix has released those on home video. I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure you can get like Daredevil and shit. I, hmm. I don't know. I don't know that for a fact, but I'm almost certain that that's a thing. All right then. Uh, let's see. Well, anyways, let's get into the story then. So the big thing yes. that I was really excited for going into the post Endgame uh, Marvel MCU projects was the fallout, the repercussions of the blip. The blip being the in-universe term for the snap Thanos made that wiped out half of the universe and then the second snap that from Iron Man that brought everyone back and so yes. there were a few there were like hints and glimpses into the post blip world um, with the likes of Spider-Man Far From Home and WandaVision uh, yes. I wasn't too I mean both of them provided di unique uh, viewpoints on the post blip on the consequences of living in a post blip world but i this was definitely what i was looking for i was looking for something that had like that explored the global consequences of the blip and you know yeah. with everyone gone in return because both of those shows explored the blip on a very personal level like yes. how the blip how the blip has affected these characters and this um i mean there's a little bit of that obviously but it, it's more about pulling back and seeing what is the geopolitical landscape post blip and you kind of have to do that when you're making a political thriller mm -hmm. uh, that's that's set in the marvel world you kind of have to take whatever's been whatever crazy stuff has gone on in continuity into account there yeah uh, and and the mcu has always been great about doing that you know the sokovia accords in you know uh civil as a war? response to, as a yeah in civil war as a response to what happened in age of ultron um so that's that's really interesting also other really cool world building stuff in this show like we explored the concept of like how do the avengers get paid <laughs> which oh <is> yeah <laughs> Which is something that they've never really talked about and that I never really thought about, to be honest with you. Uh -huh. And uh, apparently they're sort of a charitable organization. Uh, I'm right. like, a, and I'm like, Tony, you couldn't have cut them a check. Like, fuck. <laughs> like, come on. <laughs> you couldn't have given them benefits, you know? Some, hey, den some, some dental plans. I guess they got, I guess if they chose to live on the Avengers compound, they got room and board. But I mean, that's, uh, you know. What can you do? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> you need a paycheck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and so, in terms of like the type of characters to focus on, to have to be the focus of this, um, you know, global political thriller, I'm so glad it, it made perfect sense to focus on two characters that were essentially, you know, Captain America's allies, his his sidekicks, if you will. Um, and uh, much like Win Falcon and Winter Soldier, they really shed a huge light on two characters who haven't gotten that much of the spotlight and were always like supporting characters. So having them at the forefront, uh, it benefited them as much as they uh, as much as WandaVision did for Wanda and Vision, respectively. And uh, yeah, on top of that, it was also really cool of them to bring back uh, Baron Zemo and do yes. a lot more with him than I feel like they did. I feel like, honestly, as much as I enjoyed Zemo in Civil War, I feel like he really, he definitely, this was definitely not his move. That was definitely not his movie, as a lot of the, a lot of the tension was placed between Captain America and Iron Man. Whereas this one, he was pretty much made as the third major player of the of the series practically from beginning to end and uh yeah. he really shined in this show in particular 
Absolutely, absolutely. And then you know they uh, they they tweaked his character a little bit. They made him uh, closer to his comic book counterpart. Uh, you could accuse this as of being a retcon, but much like what they revealed about Wanda in WandaVision, I don't consider it as so much a retcon as it is just added information. Mm. Uh, in Civil War, they say that he was Sokovian Special Forces. They never say that he was a, a, a Baron. However, those two things are not mutually exclusive. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, he, could, he can be both. So uh, it's not really a problem. It's just, uh, you know, something to note. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, he's he's a joy in this show. We get to spend a lot more time with him than we did prior. And uh, we get to see sort of the fun side of Zemo. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> he is a pretty he's a pretty sassy kind of character in, as as it turns out. He's a fun guy. I would hang out with Zemo. <laughs> I, I want that coat. I want that fucking yes, coat. Yes, he is a badass coat and a badass mask, which I was sorely disappointed that he only wears that mask once for no explained reason other than I guess it was to protect his face from some pyrotechnics. Yeah, I wish he had put it back on in the scene where he was killing Carly or trying to kill Carly and then started smashing the uh, the super soldier vials because I think he should wear it during action scenes mm-hmm. and then take and then take it off during talking scenes because Daniel Bruhl's, you know, uh, uh, in, in, emoting is so good. Yes, uh, what definitely. a fan! What a fantastic actor he oh, is. Ab- um, totally, absolutely, man. And like I always knew that from Inglorious Bastards and Civil War, but he just really shined in this show mm-hmm. in a way that he didn't get to previously. And apparently, he uh, from what you told me, he blew everyone's minds during that one club scene where he's just do. You see him just dancing for like two seconds, and at that yes. point, okay, you the tell the story. Demanded. Uh, so it came out in an interview. Well, first of all, the internet fell in love with that little five-second moment of just Baron Zemo dancing <laughs> get, in the club. Get, getting his groove on, getting jiggy exactly. with it. It was amazing. I loved it. You loved it. Everyone loved it. Um, <laughs> chicks loved it. Uh, so uh, he, uh, it came out during, I believe it was during an interview, uh, perhaps on Good Morning America. I'm not sure. But uh, somebody was interviewing Daniel Brule not long after that episode aired. And it came to light that he had improvised his dancing and that there was a lot more footage <laughs> of him dancing than what we saw. And so the internet demanded that Marvel release the Zemo cut. <laughs> and uh, Marvel did. It's out there. You can find it. There is like, from what I understand, nearly an hour of footage of just uh, Baron Zemo doing all kinds of different dance moves. Uh, and, well, I want to uh, see. I want to see him do the running man now. And I just love the fact that we live in a world where that is a thing. Indeed. God bless that man. (laughs) Thank you, the internet, for making this possible. Right. (laughs) In no other decade would this be possible. (laughs) No, no, sir. It's like, we're desperate for content, folks. It's been a year already. Give me more Daniel Brule running. (laughs) Uh, So the other thing that to focus on would definitely be on uh as mentioned we had uh sebastian stan as uh bucky barnes aka winter soldier aka white wolf and we have anthony uh anthony mackie as sam wilson aka falcon aka the new captain america and spoilers andres God, well, it's know. fully endorsed this is an entire spoiler <laughs> show if people don't know that 30 episodes in Captain Spoilers over here, all right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> they call yes, me the Spoiler. <laughs> See, he finally did the damn thing. He became Captain Falcon. He put on the... <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I you keep making that same, that same mistake. And they even made reference to it in the actual show in the last episode. So what are you're not you, the Captain only... Falcon? Yeah, you're not the only one. I've heard so many people make that... Either <laughs> yes. make it as a... Either make it as a joke or say it in... Uh, you know, uh, unintentionally, <laughs> it's <laughs> you're, you're definitely not alone in that. Right. Uh, also, uh, I do love the running gag where many people in his community kept calling him Black Falcon, just because back in the '70s that was like the thing you did with all black superheroes, like like Black Thunder, Black Thunder, Black Lightning, Black Lightning. Black Gol- sorry, <laughs> Black Vulcan, Black Goliath, Black Panther. Like it just never stopped. Right. Uh, so, what was it? Um, it was really great to see uh, the see Falcon in you know as the main protagonist. And at the end of Endgame, he was given the shield. He was pretty much like uh, uh, Steve Rogers passed the mantle of Captain America specifically onto 
uh, on on to Falcon, in which case he felt like he could not live up to the legacy of uh, to Steve's legacy, and so he ended up pa- um, giving the shield, donating the shield to the American government, thinking that they were going to preserve it in a museum for for the rest of time, which it really right. s- set up the conflict between Falcon and Winter Soldier, as F- Winter Soldier was all for falcon like falcon living up to steve's final request his you know his best bud's final wishes uh by the way steve never shows up in this show and i'm I'm glad that they didn't uh i can always i can always like imagine that he's just somewhere he's just out there looking over everyone like like santa claus if you will (laughs) yeah there's kind of a weird mystique about him in this show too they talk about him like in a way where it's like i don't know if he's dead or if he's just like in deep hiding you know like uh i have have no idea i mean it's entirely possible that because this this is like six months after in game and he was pretty old at that point you know maybe he died at some point but uh i don't know it's not really explained (laughs) It's like, hey, uh, Steve, are you going to come back for this show? Nope, I don't think I will. I don't think I will. <laughs> I just go back to being the president of the United States. Uh... And, 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 trying, and trying to listen to Despacito over his phone for, for no reason. Poor kids are just as talented as white kids. Um... Oh. <laughs> oh, Steve. <laughs> Uh, speaking of well, at least like there, there is definitely that mystique about him however we can confirm he's not on the moon not on the moon he's I mean maybe moon. though he's on Mars no nah, who knows <laughs> he's in space with Nick Fury spice spice he's exploring other dimensions he's with Mephisto oh no, my um, god he <laughs> Yeah, we, we don't really know what happened to old Steve. I, I really love the choice, by the way, to bring in Don Cheadle during that whole um, museum yeah. uh-huh. sequence. Because Rhodey is really the one person on Earth, I think, who really gets the position that Sam is in. Mm-hmm. He, he knows what it's like to sort of, first of all, to have come up in the shadow of this of this uh, much more you know, well-known and popular hero in the form of Tony Stark. Mm-hmm to uh to be sort of the black sidekick for a long time i didn't want to say it but i'm so glad you did yeah i mean you know it's it's a trope and it exists and he was the black sidekick what are you gonna do about it hey we got another Uh, black sidekick in the form of battlestar exactly we'll get to him yes uh but uh he knows exactly what that and now with tony gone he's kind of the only guy out there holding down the iron man legacy and, and he also knows what it's like to be a black guy wearing red white and blue because if you remember he had the whole ah, iron patriot thing yeah, yeah, going on true. back in iron man 3. so he really gets the position that sam is in and i thought it was really smart to ha- have him come in and, and have that conversation with him and of course you know don Cheadle. I keep calling him Don Cheadle. Rhodey, he did all those things without a moment's hesitation. Yeah. Uh, and so for him, he's he's the voice that says, you know, why didn't you take up the shield? You know, you need to take up the shield. You got to fight the good fight. And then there's another character introduced later on mm-hmm. who, who plays as the sort of opposite viewpoint to that yeah. and is like, why would you want that shield? You know, it's, it's, and it's, um, well, he, I mean, he's, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm essentially uh, fuck the government, <laughs> fuck, fuck right. America. I, I'm beating around the bush here, but there's a lot of discussion about uh, race in America in this oh, series, yeah. as you as you would expect there to be. Yeah. Now yeah. that there's a black uh, Captain America, and uh, yeah, and there's of course already been a lot of you know keep your politics out of my politically charged comic book character show, uh, and so I mean if you're going to go in with a very politically charged uh, story, whether it be social politics or just like international global politics, I feel like Captain America is definitely the one character that it, that suits that sort of deal. It's kind of like, you know, when it comes to grim and gritty dark story, like grim and gritty stories, works for a character like Batman, not so much for a character like Superman. And such is the case for a they politically... They keep trying. <laughs> yeah, God knows they have. So yeah, it works to have like political stuff, um, elements like that, in a Captain America focused story, even if Captain America is technically not in the in the movie, you definitely know that this is playing with Captain America's world per se. Right, Captain America stories have always been inherently political, just by nature of what he is. Yeah, he's you know? some he's someone who is the representation of America, and that comes with a lot of baggage. 
of right. var- started, various, various kinds of baggage, sorry. He started out as war propaganda, very uh, successful war propaganda back during World War II, and then during the 60s with Vietnam, when he came back, it, his, his, it became a lot more about, like, you know, what we saw Steve go through in the movies, where it was, like, reconciling his personal code with what the government is doing, and, you know, he's always had that going on. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, you do a Captain America story, it's going to get political. And when you when you have a black Captain America... Mm-hmm. you're gonna get into some of these issues and it's right. not like that's the only thing the show is about no you know, of the course show there's, is, there's a the there's show, a lot of layers to this show the show is about a lot of things that's just sort of the central question especially as related to that character yeah and it is a very interesting question what does it mean for a black man to represent to take on a, a mantle that represents all of america and uh, yeah, that that is something that that is certainly as someone who is not a, of African American descent, I do not know what that is like in particular. So it is kind of fascinating for me to see that to un- understand this kind of viewpoint, and that is something that Bucky himself does not understand, nor something Steve could ever understand. However, they don't villainize Steve nor uh, Bucky for not un- for not getting it. Um, but they, in Bucky's case, he does come to, to support Sam with whatever situation he ultimately goes with. By the way, the fact that his nephews call him Uncle Sam made me realize how perfect of a choice it was for him to be kept, for Uncle Sam to be Captain America. Right. Also, I love the choice to make because this was never the case in the comics. This mm-hmm. was something that they took from Anthony Mackie mm-hmm. uh, from his personal life. The choice of making the Falcon from Louisiana and, mm-hmm. and, and, and giving him that sort of uh, that flavor to his character. Mm-hmm. Really, really great. I mean, Anthony Mackie, obviously, because he's from Louisiana in real life, ah. uh, he is able to play that very naturally. And also it's it's just it's 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 so unique. We don't have a lot of. You know, we need more Southern superheroes, Andres. We don't have very many. <laughs> I'm sure you appreciate that as a Southerner yourself. Yeah, it also gave all that stuff a, a little bit of a Forrest Gump vibe, which I really appreciate. Yes, with the boats and everything. Yeah. How funny is it that, you know, WandaVision ended with a philosophical discussion around a theoretical boat? Yes. And then, uh, <laughs> and then Falcon and Winter Soldier uh, involves a visual metaphor of, building, of um, fixing a physical boat. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder who knows uh, yeah. who knows what boat themed uh, shenanigans will happen in Loki. Right. But, uh, <laughs> he, he's going to somehow what was it? What's that show even about? I can't tell what the hell they're doing with Loki. Seems like he's going to be bouncing around timelines and trying to fix time anomalies with the TVA and it's like what is he going to uh, show also, up on is he going to show up on the Titanic or something? Possibly. Uh, apparently he's been DB Cooper all along oh and my uh God. And, uh, you know, every time he will hope that the next leap will be the leap home. (laughs) One day he'll wake up and look in the mirror and say, I'm retarded. And then that's... (laughs) And hopefully he whips out his Owen Wilson impression at some point during the show and gives us a nice solid wow. Uh, But that's all I gather from the trailers. Okay. Uh, Let's see. And... uh... You, you did yeah i i, I love ahead. that cho- I, as to finish what i was saying i yeah. love that choice of of make of give making the fal- the falcon a proud a southerner a, a uh, louisiana fishing boat uh, guy and i hope perhaps that that uh, idea gets incorporated into the comics later on i think it would be great possibly, it certainly I mean- Go ahead. I think it makes the character more interesting you know anything you can do that adds a little bit more flavor mm. uh is going to make the character more interesting Uh uh-huh admittedly i have not read any comics that featured the falcon and my only exposure to the falcon i think was he in the 90s avengers united we stand uh series i think he might have been in earth's mightiest heroes i'm not sure he's i think he was let me check real quick I know that he's plays a prominent role in the superhero squad show. Right. And uh, he, he was like the young he was like the young newcomer for uh, Avengers Assemble, which was the Avengers animated series that t- that was made after um uh, Earth's Mightiest Heroes, which I never saw at all. Right. I'm looking up the Avengers United We Stand. He he was in that show. Yeah, he was in United We Stand. United They Stand 
and then yeah. the Superhero Squad show, and Earth's Mightiest Heroes, and Avengers Assemble. It's interesting because at the time, United We Stand was weird because it was a show that used like a bunch of obscure characters that most people didn't know about. Right. And now all but two of those characters are in yeah. the MCU. Like, okay, so we have Ant-Man, the Wasp. Wonder Man, we still haven't gotten him. Tigra, right. haven't gotten her. Hawkeye, Falcon, Scarlet. Vision, and Scarlet Witch. Yes. Yeah, yeah. All but all but two are, are already in the MCU now. Yeah, and meanwhile, like well, I was a kid, and when this series came, I remember when this series came out in like '99, and I was like, "Who the fuck are these guys?" Right. Oh, at this I was point, vaguely I was like, aware that there was an Avengers team in the comics, but I was like, this doesn't feel like that same team. <laughs> I mean, at that point, I was like, who? what the fuck is an Avengers? I, I recognize Iron Man, Thor, and Captain America up there in that title sequence, but I don't see them here. Right, exactly. I was like, yeah. Uh, and it yeah. didn't help that like, you know, the uh. Justice League cartoon <laughs> was, it became a thing later on, and it's like that. By comparison, it's like, eh, you know? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so I have like zero personal attachment to the falcon and pretty much the mcu version of the falcon has been the one i've been exposed to the most and so i cannot tell whether or not a, this character has been done justice in terms of ad, uh, adapting from the comics but it was, certainly has been a very interesting uh, evolution of the character um within the context of the mcu and speaking of context his eventual decision and transformation into becoming the next Cap uh, Captain America w w felt incredible felt very natural and made perfect sense within the context of the MCU timeline um obviously Cap old Captain America retired he did what he wanted to do and wanted to wanted to you know hang up the mantle pass it on to Sam Sam had to go through a very large uh you know sort of personal journey self discovery learning what he wants to do with him with his life and what he wishes to represent and ends up do becoming a new symbol of hope for everyone um I cannot tell when how i you know i don't know the story sam's story of how he how comic sam became captain america i never read that story i've never heard anyone talk about that story it seemed like just out of the blue it's like oh by the way sam wilson is now captain america and i was like yeah okay i guess <laughs> Yeah, sorry. What happened in the comics is, uh, I forget the exact details, but somehow Steve's super soldier serum was, like, taken f away from him, and he basically aged, caught up with him, and he got all shriveled and old. Yeah. Kind of like what happened at the end of Endgame, but for different reasons. Uh -huh. and, then, uh, and then Sam had to take over the mantle. Okay, but by that point, we've already had a bu uh, Bucky Captain America, right? Mm -hmm. Cause that yeah, Bucky, Bucky, Bucky he, had already been Captain America for a while, and then that's when Steve died before he got better at the end of Civil War, the comic version of Civil War. Yeah, and then I believe it was during Sam's run that then the Hydra Cap stuff happened. Uh huh. Ah, uh, okay, okay. Yeah, that, that is very yeah. It's, it's very weird and convoluted, but uh, like I said, it just makes so much sense within the MCU for for Falcon to become Captain America, especially over. Bucky, as much as I, lo I love seeing Bucky, he's definitely got his own like personal issues to overcome, and perhaps Steve knew that himself, which made more sense why he chose wi uh, Sam over uh, over Bucky. And uh, in, but even still, I'm I feel like by including both characters in here, they got to play a little bit of an homage to the fact that Bucky was Captain America in the comics by having him be able to toss the shield around and being so being pretty much like Fal Falcon's right hand man. All right, I mean Bucky gets to continue being what he's always been, which is you know Captain America's uh, friend slash partner slash sidekick kind of. Uh, but just does don't tell him that. And the Marvel doesn't really do sidekicks usually. That uh, is true. Yeah. Oh, speaking of sidekicks, I was surprised they also brought in his like Falcon's actual Falcon in the form of a of a uh, drone, which took me by surprise. Yeah, that was introduced in Civil War, but uh, yeah, they they played that up a lot more here. Mm -hmm. And uh, ooh, that does remind me. Uh, in terms of special effects, they really uh. They, they really brought their A game with that opening sequence uh, that featured Sam on a mission to retrieve a hostage from some terrorists from one of the past uh, MCU movies. 
and uh they didn't really they haven't they didn't really do anything that special effects heavy for a good chunk for the for at least the middle part of the movie uh oftentimes when you see sam and sam fighting he's usually without his wings or he's using his wings but not really for flying more so for uh, some like a uh, hand-to-hand -hand combat stuff so they i thought it was a really interesting way of handling their budget like they were trying to go for movie quality fight uh action scenes but they saved a lot of it for the beginning and end but still kept it engaging in the middle but you can tell they were holding back Right, you do get at least one like really cool action sequence per episode, mm -hmm. but the one, the, you know, the the ones at the beginning and the end are definitely the most elaborate. Mm -hmm. Right, right, and that features a lot of uh, Falcon doing what Falcon does best. Yes, uh, let's see. Uh, but you know, the, go ahead. I'm so glad that we have because you know at the end of Endgame, Cap hands him the shield and he has that little moment of you know, hesitation, but then he ultimately accepts it. And you just assume, sitting in the theater in 2019, okay, next time we have an Avengers movie or a Captain America movie, Sam's going to show up in, the, in his Captain America suit and he's mm -hmm. just going to be Captain America. Um, and you know, but but now it, in hindsight, it's so much better that we got this just this whole season of just him debating whether he wanted to take up the mantle and, you know, really grappling with those questions. And it, it, it makes his eventual decision to become Captain America mm -hmm. feel so much more earned and feel like he deserves it even more so than if it had just been, Oh, he got, he got it because Steve gave him the shield, you know, right, right. He, had, he had to go through a journey of his own to really become Captain America. It wasn't just here's the shield and now you're the guy. Right, right. Which I, it, it, it felt which I really of, appreciate. Right. It felt kind of forced at the end of Endgame where it's like, oh, here you go now. We're doing this because it happened in the comics. I was like, wait, what? You can't, or, don't, shouldn't you have some time to think it over, Steve? But no, yeah, this series really helped uh, bridge the gap between Phase 3 Sam and Phase 4 Sam. And uh, yeah, Absolutely. like like I said in the beginning, it was a very it felt like a very natural uh, conclusion to that part of his of his story arc. There, uh, let's see. Since we're talking about Captain America, let's talk about the other Captain America we got in this yes, series. Because here's the thing: Sam Wilson is not the second Captain America. He is, in fact, the third Captain America. He had the option to become the second Captain America, but he passed on that option. Yeah, the he had he gave him the chance to be a hero, and he blew it. Right, and so the government appointed their own Captain America in the form of John Walker, who those of us who know the comics know, know mostly as U.S. agent. Now, for those of you who are unaware, there have been many, many, many people who have taken the Captain America mantle over the years in the comics. They usually have it for a while, and eventually it always reverts back to Steve. But there have been a, a large number of people who have, who have you know, been in the suit, and John Walker slash the U.S. agent is one of those people. Right. Uh, I assume I, I freaking I love. Uh, I was John just going to sorry John Walker in this show. I, I uh, Wyatt Russell really fucking blew me away in this show. He he he's that kid's got chops, and we we really get to see it on full display. Uh, the rest of the fandom much more split on him than I was. <laughs> People hated this motherfucker, even when he did something right. People like yeah, well, I still hate his ass. Like it just they they would not, they would not give this they wouldn't give this kid a break. Yeah, and the, the like, thing that sucks is like they were attacking the actor per, like personally. It's like, dude, he's just playing a character, guys. He's just doing a, his job. This, right. this this isn't like a Brie Larson situation where she comes off the actress herself comes off as unlikable in in the press. No, th this white white Russell is just doing his job, guys. <laughs> right, he's the exact opposite. He comes across as just one of the nicest human beings in the world in like interviews and things. He really seems like a very genuine, you know, guy. Kirk did a good job with this kid. Uh, fucking and and the and the man can fucking act. He's great. He's yeah. amazing. I I can't wait to see more of him in the MCU. I'm so glad that he now is sort of separate from the Captain America mantle, and he can go forward and forge his own identity as the U.S. agent. Yes, yes, doing whatever Elaine from Seinfeld will have him do. Right. Oh my God, I couldn't believe they brought that actress back. Yes, 
that they teased that there was going to be like a, a big character reveal in that episode. And of course, we were like, who is it? Is it so and so? Is it so and so? Is it Mephisto? And it was not. It was not Mephisto. Damn it. It was, it was not. It was Julia Louise Dreyfus playing the Contessa Valentina Allegra de Fontaine, to which many fans said, who? Uh, <laughs> but. <laughs> This, this was definitely your series because you were getting all the the, the obscure comic refer like comic pulls and call callbacks here. Yes, the Countessa Valentina Allegra de Fontaine is a very complex character with a very long and complicated history. She uh, was originally a S.H.I.E.L.D. agent slash a love interest for Nick Fury. And then come to find out she was like a Russian sleeper agent at one point. She was connected to an organization called Leviathan, which was a, a, an intelligence organization that was founded by ex-KGB members. And then uh, she was one of the many people who have had the title of Madam Hydra for a while, but that was sort of a situation where she was like using Hydra for her own ends as opposed to actually like being a Hydra believer. Uh, and so she's a very complicated character who's, you know, she's just one of those spies who's always up to something, you know, <laughs> she's very much the, the dark reflection of Nick Fury. And I really hope that we get some screen time between the two of them in the future, mm -hmm. because that would be great. Now, is you what kind of? And she played by, and she's played by Julia Louise Dreyfus, who is amazing. And uh, yes, she still got yeah. it. She's still and barely aged. Yeah, that woman. I was. Uh, I also wanted to say that she still looks great for her age. Absolutely, freaking literally. Uh, she is, uh, and uh, what kind of character it has was U.S. Agent in the comics, from what you can remember, recall? U.S. Agent is one of these characters that sort of rides the line a lot of the times between hero and anti-hero. John Walker was the Captain America who um, was a little bit unhinged and was much more willing to get his hands dirty. Uh, you know, Captain America by way of the Punisher. And this came about, this came about because, you know, characters at the time like the Punisher were very popular and characters like Captain America were seen as more sort of hokey and out of out of touch. Mm -hmm. And so and so they introduced John Walker, Captain America, the Captain America who will gun you down. <laughs> uh, basically, imagine like Captain America from the Ultimates universe. That's a lot closer to what, you know, John Walker would, would be right. like. I, I can imagine John Walker being the one to say, you think the A on my forehead stands for France? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, it was, it, was, it was very much an attempt to be like, this is the brand new Captain America, and he fucks, like, you know, and it's like, <laughs> and then eventually, you know, uh, Cap takes the, the mantle, uh, Steve takes the mantle back, and he goes off and becomes U.S. agent. And yeah, he, he's, 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 again, he rides that line a lot of the times between, like, heroic character and anti-hero, and it's because he is much more about the mission. He is much more of a soldier. He is much more the guy who, you know, is given an assignment and he goes out and he does it, you know, uh, as opposed to somebody like Steve, who uh, sort of is always following his own moral compass uh, more often uh, than not. Mm -hmm. Very true. So, uh, yeah, U U.S. Agent is a very interesting character and I can't wait to see more from from Wyatt Russell. What, what amazing casting that turned out to be. Yeah. Just, and you know what? It could have been so easy to make him just like this ultra Chad jock dude bro asshole cap type of character for to easily build him up as like the bad guy to take down at the end of the series. But that's not really what they do with him at all. He's a genuinely decent, likable character who's just trying to do what the right. He's just trying to do the right thing, and right. he's just unfortunately a a, a a victim of much like. Uh, like Sam living in the shadow of Steve Rogers and always being compared to Steve Rogers living up to the mantle of, of Captain America. And while he uh, smart, I thought it was very smart that he never actually has that discussion. He never, they never straight up tell you, Hey man, this job's really hard, you know, living in his shadow and whatnot. Rather you just see it through his own actions and his just his everyday conversations with him and his best buddy, uh, Battlestar as well as every uh, other people around him, like his wife and whatnot, and you can just see it in his uh, in his eyes, in his words, his mannerisms. That yeah, this job really is getting to him. And by the time they, you know, his 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 best friend is killed, unfortunately, 
it per makes sense why he would just snap all of a sudden and end up bashing a dude to death with, with that shield. Right, exactly. And that is such a huge moment for the show. We will we'll definitely talk more about that. Um, yeah, I, I think the people who don't like John Walker, and that's mm -hmm. a huge portion of the fan base, maybe, maybe, all, maybe most of them, I feel like they see him the way you described I, I think they see him as that sort of obnoxious like dude bro kind of a guy and you know he has some douchey tendencies sure but, but i don't but, know but I, so so does sam and sam and bucky in this show right and I, I see him more as what you like yeah me and you have the same read on this guy i see him as just like pretty much a normal guy uh -huh. he's not a moral paragon like steve rogers who the fuck is he's just he's a regular he's he's what would happen if one of us got superpowers <laughs> on trade yeah he's just a regular guy i don't he's know if i there. can handle this man he's, 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 <laughs> he's trying this, to... this shit's this shit's fucking hard man he's trying to help these guys and they're just like fuck you at every turn and he's like fuck you, 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 you ain't steve, steve. <laughs> He's like, I'm not trying to be Steve. Just want to do the job. And it's like, it's a whole thing. And then the, whole fu the fucking bullshit that the government pulls after he has his freak out. Yeah. Like, I understand stripping him with the title and saying you can't be Captain America anymore. But when they were like, you're not going to receive any b benefits. I'm like, fuck you, yeah. no, U.S. You, you US government. My, how dare you strip a man of his chance to get a discount 7-Eleven discount coffee? If anybody needs to access to the VA, it's this guy. He's he's fucking been through it, man. His oh, his head yeah. is not right. <laughs> this man his has head had, is uh, not right. This man has been through like several miss missions. They allude to a lot of the fucked up shit that he and Battlestar had to go through. Exactly, exactly. Oh, yeah. uh, and, and since, that, since oh, I, and the other yeah. thing, I'm so glad that they did not do with this but. character, because obviously going into Falcon and the Winter Soldier ahead of time, I knew that Wyatt Russell had been cast as John Walker, so I knew that U.S. Agent was going to be in the show, mm. and I knew that they were probably because of the nature of you know Sam Wilson becoming Captain America, that there was probably going to be some discussion about race. Mm -hmm. And John Walker in the comics is also from the South, and so I was worried that mm. they were going to turn him. I was worried that they were going to do the obvious dumb thing and make John Walker like a huge racist asshole. Mm -hmm. And thank God they did not do that. In the very beginning of the second episode, they're like, they, they make it very clear that that is not the case because his best friend and wife are both black. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, and you're like, okay, whew, they're not doing that thing at least, you know? <laughs> yeah, that would, I feel like the, the way they were setting him up as his complex character making him a racist definitely would have been like the easy way out in terms of making him like the bad guy uh, i'm glad they went more nuanced with this with with, with oh, in a more nuanced direction than that absolutely i'm so, I'm so worried about that going into the show and uh thankfully they did not do that uh, yeah because and, this show was smart yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. it's smart <laughs> And smart smart that's our that's our new dork <laughs> running gag now uh so and also like speaking of like uh, like obscure pools there were like two big ones especially you mentioned yes. before of uh valentin allegra de fontaine uh, i mentioned i've alluded to battlestar several times who apparently was uh a u.s agent's uh, sidekick in the comics Yes, he originally, because they did this weird thing, even though Bucky was a name, not a title, they yes. did this weird thing for a while where anytime there was a new Captain America, they would assign him his own Bucky. And so for a while, Lamar Hoskins was John Walker's Bucky, but then come to find out, apparently Buck is a racial slur and they uh -oh. didn't know that. <laughs> So then they, whoops, so then they gave him a whole new costume and they called him Battlestar and he was John Walker's uh sidekick for i think the rest of his tenure as captain america i could be wrong about that yeah. um and john walker was captain america in the comics for a while in fact if yeah. i'm not mistaken i think he might have been the current captain during the whole infinity gauntlet thing when that happened in the comics oh, wow. so, okay. and at that time steve was running around in the black suit under just the title the captain um hmm. okay so uh, and I, again i might be getting some of my uh, some of the timeline mixed up there it's all comic booky and complex and wibbly wobbly but um mm -hmm. uh so yeah the, the lamar hoskins i never imagined in a million years we would get battlestar mm -hmm. in this show battlestar <laughs> nor the other character that you got excited for yes 
this was huge. This was huge. This is a big deal. You had never heard of this character. I, I had to educate you real fat quick. Yes. Um, Isaiah Bradley, the original black Captain America uh, from, uh, I don't remember what war it was in the, I think it was actually World War II in the comics. Hmm. Like he was like, like around. Short, like shortly after Captain Cap went under ice? Uh, n no, actually, I think Steve was already running around, doing, was still running around doing stuff when they were experimenting on them. Because the whole thing was Erskine had been oh, murdered. I guess it was the Korean War. Well, I, at least in this version. In this version, it was the Korean War. I'm pretty sure, though, that in the comic, um, it was still World War II and yeah. Steve was still running around doing stuff while they were experimenting on on these black guys to try and recreate the super soldier formula because as you recall Dr. Erskine the original creator of the super soldier formula had died yes um, had, had been murdered uh, by Moited. Nazis waited by Nazis and so um so that's fucked up. Yeah. And... Oh yeah. By the way, the fact that they they took inspiration from the Tuskegee syphilis study, which is one of the most fucked up things the U.S. government officially did, like, and that's like it's on the public records. You can learn uh, learn about this the Tuskegee syphil syphilis studies. That's like yeah. to do su to to take such like a horrifying real life event and use it as like the basis for what the MCU's version of the US government did to Isaiah Bradley and his bro and his brothers in arms genius right there absolutely absolutely and i would recommend anybody listening to go check out the uh, the comic uh, the original comic truth red white and black i believe it's called mm -hmm. this was published in the early 2000s i couldn't tell you the exact year um, but yes it's it's fascinating stuff and i've been speculating for a long time that they were going to do a Young Avengers movie at some point down the line, probably Phase 5, because they've released the slate for Phase 4. Mm -hmm. um, and this was just a final nail in the coffin for me. They're doing that fucking Young Avengers movie because uh, we even were introduced to Isaiah Bradley's grandson, um, Elijah Bradley. I always want to say Josiah Bradley, but that was Isaiah's son, not grandson. Elijah Bradley who is a founding member of the Young Avengers. He runs around as in, with the... Uh, name patriot mm -hmm. um and it's sort of like a teenage cap type character yeah oh here we go yeah truth red white and black was published in 2004 and was uh, seven seven issues long by robert morales and kyle baker 2004 right right, right. and it's so sm it, it's so perfect it fits so well into what we already knew in the mcu mm -hmm. we've always known ever since the incredible hulk came out all the way back in 2008 we've always known that the government the u.s government and most likely other governments around the world were constantly trying to recreate the super soldier formula after steve rogers uh, got it, which makes sense. It's like a new arms race, except the only guy who knew how to make the bomb is dead, and you have to <laughs> try to re-engineer the bomb all over again. Uh, so it's 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 taking established lore that they set up all the way back then in 2008, and then adding in this this story from the comics that just fits so nicely into the MCU that I can't believe I never saw it coming. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I do really like how earlier you mentioned that Isaiah Bradley was a character who was meant on the is on the opposite side, whereas with Don Cheadle or um, uh, I, I'm blanking out War Machine, Rhodey, Rhodey is telling uh, Sam Wilson to take the man, pick up the mantle of Captain America. Uh, meanwhile, you have Isaiah who's telling him, "Fuck that mantle! It's gonna cause you nothing like nothing but pain, like it did for me." And uh, it's very, it's a very interesting sort of uh, dichotomy there, where you have uh, Isaiah, who's sort of like he's he's definitely been wronged for uh, wrong, he's definitely he's been wronged, and he is in his right to be upset, to be so uh, pessimistic, and be like, hey man, they are never gonna America, the gov whether it's Amer the government or the people, they are never going to accept a black Captain America. You know, it's like. Meanwhile, you have, and then you end up with Sam, who is saying, yes, he acknowledges that there is a lot of fucked up things in the world, like racism, but he is kind of embodying that optimistic spirit saying like, yes, there is fucked up things about, about America and the world, but that doesn't mean we can try, we can, he can't stop to try and find a solution to make it better. 
Right. And the the actor who plays Isaiah Bradley, I'm blanking on the name, but the famous actor, you know, very mm-hmm. prolific. Um, he does an amazing job also. Super, uh, yeah. Honestly, I think, oh yeah, so his name, his the actor's name was Carl Lumbly. Yes, uh, Carl Lumbly. Yeah. yeah. He's probably, like, Isaiah Bradley might be my favorite part of the entire series. Now, there's never a moment in the show where Sam comes out and explains to anybody why he didn't take the shield. Yeah. Um, and it's because you get that in the form of Isaiah Bradley. Isaiah Bradley is a representation, a physical manifestation, if you will, mm-hmm. of all of uh, Sam's uh, doubts doubts and his thought process and why he didn't take the shield. It's all laid out in that character. Um, and so you don't have to have him come out and say, well, this is why I did it because you sort of reveal it, you know, the audience figures it out through his interactions with Isaiah. And it's just, it's fantastically, it's it's very well done. Mm, absolutely. Also, apparently this actor, Carl Lumbly, uh, played the voice of Martian Manhunter in Justice League Doom. Ah. As well as Silas Stone from Justice League Gods and Monsters. Oh. So this isn't his uh, his first uh, go around in superhero medium. Also, apparently he was additional voices in Batman and Mr. Freeze Sub Zero. This guy's yeah, had not... quite an interesting uh, life here, a uh, uh, career here. Yeah, absolutely. So he, he does a great job. He's a great job. Mm-hmm. Um, so Andres, what did you think about this? Uh... The reintroduction of Sharon Carter to the MCU. I was pleasantly surprised by this, given that, you know, she hadn't been seen since Winter Soldier. And uh, I forgot how long. Yeah, I think Winter Soldier was like 2014, 2015. So you're wrong. You're wrong. She was in Civil War. Oh, right. She was in Civil War. Oh, really? Now? okay. so she 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 only ever appeared in one movie in 2016, I believe. And then from then on, we hadn't heard. No, 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 no. She nope. was in both movies. She oh. was in Winter Soldier and in Civil War. Ah, so, okay. Brief, brief refresher. In Winter Soldier, yes. she was Cap's neighbor, who we then found out was a S.H.I.E.L.D. agent who had been assigned to watch over him. And then in, uh, and then she helped out in the at the end when the Hydra and S.H.I.E.L.D. were fighting each other at the Triskelion. And then um, in Civil War, we find out that she's Peggy's niece at when we see her at Peggy's funeral, mm-hmm. uh, she helps Cap. Um, she she uh, she brings him his shield after after they uh, go on the the run before the whole airport thing, and then uh, and then that's the last we saw. They have the the kiss, which is really weird in retrospect. Oh, yeah. And then she and then she le- left, and that was the last that we had seen of her up until now. Right, so she was essentially like uh, Peggy Carter's replacement in terms of like being a new love interest for Steve Rogers until she just wasn't needed anymore because at that point there weren't going to be any more Steve Roger movies. So from then on, it's like, yeah, we, we haven't hadn't seen, uh, what's the phrase, like sight nor hair of her. Uh, right. We, we haven't seen her at all, and so, yeah, it was very uh, a pleasant surprise to see this character make a comeback in in a way where it feels like they... It's very true to this version's universe of Peggy, given what she went through in the last movie, and so this sort was felt more like a... Not just a reintroduction, but also kind of like a revision, a revised or revisioned version of her. Uh, in which case she is someone who is not so much of a goody two-shoes like Captain America once was, but rather she is someone who kind of plays a very morally ambiguous role in terms of her being forced into a position where she need, in order to survive, she needs to make the most out of her situation, uh, resulting in her becoming uh, someone who sells weapons and information and things like that w- among uh, very shady individuals. And as we later find out, she plays a significantly larger role within this underworld, uh, this world of underground or under, un- yeah, this underworld or underground area of, of illegal trading. Uh, she plays a much more larger part of that world than initially thought. Exactly. Now, I got the feeling hmm. while, while watching this that you were 
surprised by the twist with her near the end. Yes, I was. Yeah, I, I was, it was as it was that's revealed. Really, that's, yeah. that's really interesting because this was basically the opposite of Mephisto. Yeah. And, <laughs> while this show was coming out, pretty much everybody pegged that she was going to be the power broker at the right. end. <laughs> and so when they revealed it, yeah. I guess it was kind of like Agatha Harkness. Everybody was like, "Yeah, we, we know." Uh, <laughs> so I was, uh, I, I was pleased that they they got you with that one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, well, here's you were, the thing. you were able yeah. to you were able to enjoy that twist in a way that the rest of us weren't because we saw it coming. Right. I mean, I guess I was slowly starting to figure it out by the last episode, only because they keep building up to the power broker as this like very large, intimidating figure. So of course, you know, they do the whole subversion thing by showing that it's it's it was her, it was her Austin, it was her all along. Uh, right. But uh, yeah, it's, it's sort of like a trope I've noticed in a lot of media where it's like turns out the big scary individual turns out to be like the unattractive woman that the main characters have known all along. It's it's stuff that's uh, stuff. It's often done a lot with especially uh, uh, femme fatale type characters. Um, right, and I think it's it's a really interesting thing to do with her because mm -hmm. they haven't really done anything interesting with her up until this point. Right, um, right. They just kind of go ahead. She was um, she was just a supporting character slash replacement love interest, and she, you know, we, we didn't really get a sense of who she was mm -hmm. separate separate from her relationship to Steve. Yeah, and so to now bring her back and to uh, to make her a villain moving forward, which we we don't know what what she's gonna re when she's gonna reappear. It could be in mm -hmm. Captain America four. It could be some other place. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, she's a she's in a major power position, like as a villain now, and that's that's really interesting. Oh, absolutely, yeah. In terms of a reinvention, this I feel like did a lot of of service to the character and has made her actually more interesting now that we're going to see her without Captain America. Because I doubt she's ever going to have the kind of relationship she had with with Sam than she did with Steve. Well, why you say that, Andre? <laughs> well, mainly because I aside don't know. The, aside from the fact that she's an international <laughs> criminal. <laughs> it's just that I feel like, you know, it's it's not, I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure how often it's done where it's like, oh, the last main character is out of the picture. So the new main character just inherits the love interest from the other guy. From the other guy. Right. Has that ever happened? I'm trying to think of an example. I, I feel like I've seen that recently. I'm, try I'm trying to remember what... Oh, okay. Uh, sort of... No, okay, so not really the case, but the closest I can think of, because I just saw this, was the first season of Gundam Thunderbolt, where a random dude dies, and his love interest is, like, very distraught, and so as the main character ends up spending more time with this uh, love interest, she ends up falling for him by the end of that season. But but this is not like a case where like one main character, for lack of a better term, this is going to sound horrible. One main character passes off their love interest to the next main character. This isn't that case at all. It's just <laughs> rather it's a supporting character passing off their love interest to the main character. Right. The closest thing I can think of is like in Psycho at the end of the movie, Marion's uh, boyfriend and Marion's sister. They're not together at the end of the movie, but you get the sense that they could maybe. Right. You know? Kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe in the future. Either way, it's still kind of weird. I don't know. It, it, I just get the feeling that they're not going to do that. Right. I mean, hey, for anyone listening, if you know an example of one main character pa pass, passing love interest along let us know in the in the in the comments below. And I wish there was a better way of saying that, but that's like the most like most forward way of saying it. Uh, yeah, I'm sure it I, has to have happened. I just can't think of when. <laughs> right. I'm sure there's probably you know what there's probably like a ton of dramas, TV dramas, soap operas, or freaking uh, you know rom rom coms or whatever where that situation happens for the sake of drama. You know. Um, sure. Anyways. Uh, but I was mostly I was most likely thinking of the idea of yeah her being a villain and Sam not being cool with that. Um, right. 
And uh, oh, what was the last thing I, I want to bring up? Oh yeah, so the, with her being the power broker, I had a suspicion that they were gonna that the power broker was someone that we had already met previously, simply because they kept building up this character as being a large, imposing figure that's gonna factor into the plot very, very soon. And the thing right. is, well, well, you know, there are only six episodes. And by right. the time we hit like, by the time we hit like episode three, and they're they're not introducing any new characters, you, you're just sitting there going, "All right, it's got to be somebody we know." It's got to be right, enough. right, because like there's and and once we get to the very last episode, I was like, "There's no way, no fucking way, they're gonna introduce a brand new character at the last at the very last fucking second. Uh, same it thing. It was Ralph Boner, Andres. <laughs> Ralph Boner. <laughs> He was the he was the boner broker. Oh, <laughs> he's like it's me. Uh, so yeah, when I saw once she revealed herself as the power broker, I w I wasn't surprised by that point. At first, I was like, oh wow, so they actually did went all the way with having this character do sort of like an about face. But uh, at the same time, it was also like kind of predictable. It's like yeah, yeah, this. They they had to do this at, at at some point if because it's too late to establish a brand new character by this point uh, unless they're going to do right. like that Marvel style of sequel teasing it's like oh look who it is oh it's 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 Thanos at the end of Avengers right I mean they did kind of misdirect me a little bit at the end of the fifth episode just because she hired Batroc to assist the Flag Smashers mm -hmm. which didn't seem like something the power broker would do, given that the power broker has been chasing the Flag Smashers throughout the entire series. Yeah. But then it's revealed in episode six that, you know, that truck was really there to keep, keep tabs on them so that she could close in on them. Um, uh huh. So that, so that makes sense. But by the way, Batroc is back in the show. I don't know. Whoever's listening remembers Batroc from Winter Soldier. He's, he's, <laughs> it's he's like, here. oh, yeah, my, fav uh, my favorite MCU villain, Batroc. Yeah, Batrock. <laughs> when Batrock first appeared in Winter Soldier, I was like, "Oh, that's a that's neat. That's an obscure comics villain that they, you know, brought in. That, that was that's a nice touch." And then he shows up again in that show, and you're like, "Ah, oh, how about that? <laughs> Looky there, he's <laughs> dead now." <laughs> it, it's kind of funny because this whole entire series, it's like nothing but like deep pools here, not just from Captain America comic lore, but also from just MCU lore as well. Exactly, exactly. But it doesn't matter because because now Batroc is is dead. So yes. Sharon Goddard <laughs> shot shot him <laughs> in the face. Just kidding. It probably wasn't the face, but she shot him. Yes. And uh, he's out. Batroc is now dead. Rock and now is laying in his bed. Rock. I don't apologize. It's a funky town. <laughs> um. <laughs> Uh, that was a B, that was a B fifty twos reference, if anybody. Uh, anyway, <laughs> is they did the, 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 the music for uh, yeah, yeah, Flintstones? Yeah, the, the, the bedrock twist, the twitch. Uh -huh. They say it's a fucking town. Anyway, um, <laughs> uh, I, I you know what? now I, I kind of I'm curious to see how well the Flintstone movies holds up. Oh, um, I saw it just a year or two ago. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I can watch that movie object uh, objectively though. Like, I, know. I don't know if I can. I don't know if I can go into that movie like let's see how this <laughs> like this like space jam, like space jam. Right. Let's see how this piece of cinema has aged. Uh, <laughs> uh, you, you can't approach it from that angle. No, you can't. Uh, You're but... watching the Flintstones movie with John Goodman and Halle Berry, so it's like. Ooh wee. <laughs> There are other people in that movie. Uh, uh, Rosie O'Donnell. Can't remember them. Rick Moranis. Ah, right, right. Rick Moranis. Before he Very disappeared important. from the face of the earth, up until Ronald Re Ryan Reynolds just pulled, like pulled him back out of obscurity. Did he? What did yeah, he do with Ryan Reynolds? He he, he did he did like an like an AT and T commercial. It's like, hey, I brought huh. on Rick Moranis. It's like, oh hey, uh, do you want me to advertise his phone? No, no. It's just been forever since anyone's seen you. I just want to have you here. And he's like looking at the camera. Can you believe this guy? And then Ryan Reynolds looking at the camera. Fucking Rick Moranis. I've not seen this commercial. I don't watch a whole lot of television these days. So oh, it, it was right. just it was like the talk of the internet town, uh, like last year. No, no, two years ago, I think at this point. Oh, okay, the last the last news I heard about Rick Moranis was when he got jumped in. New York yes. City. <laughs> How dare you hit you you injure America's tre national treasure? Which was a few months back, I think, or late 2020. It's... He's like, okay, now I'm going to disappear for another 20 years. 
Damn it, 2020. <laughs> you've, claimed, you've claimed another. Uh, anyways. Honey, honey, I shrunk my career. Ah. Uh, anyways, back back on, on topic. So, uh, was the Power Broker... Uh, I'm assuming the Power Broker is another deep pool from the Captain America comics. or So, like, how much of a Power, power Broker... Of a, a prowler, a prowler boker. Do you do you, do you know of? Power broker is a character who gives people superpowers for a price. He's got like, you know, he's got the he's got the drugs. He's got the thing. He'll give you superpowers if you pay him money. And uh, he is actually the one in the comics who gave uh, John Walker uh, his powers, oh, okay. um, as, as well as some others. And uh, you know, the it's a very different character, though. The, the only thing they really took from comic Power Broker mm -hmm. is the idea of him, like, trying to develop the super soldier formula and then um, inadvertently giving John Walker his powers in a roundabout way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, true. yeah, everything else is different. Sharon Carter is not the Power Broker in the comics, obviously. Is she a char another character from the comics or was she made up? She is a character from the comics. She's called Agent Thir She's called Agent Thirteen, mm. and uh, just as in the film, she is the uh, the niece or grand niece of uh, Peggy Carter. Okay, then cool. Uh, so yeah, so yeah, she, it, it's always it's always if you ever, yeah. If you ever if you ever see a, a comic panel of a lady running around in with blonde hair in what looks like the Black Widow costume, only white, that's Sharon Carter. That's Agent Thirteen. That's ah, okay then. That's, that's her whole getup. Cool, cool. Um, let's see. And I guess, like, in terms of... Since we're talking about the villains at this point, uh, was the Flag Smashers ever a part of the comics as well? Or was this some, another th a thing that's, like, made for the MCU? The Flag Smasher is a thing in the comics. He is ah. a... Carl Morgenthau is a uh, an anti-nationalist sort of terrorist. His whole thing is, like, trying to create a world without borders that they basically just took his ideology yeah they took his ideology and created an entire group in the in the show uh, but in the comics it's one guy and of course if you'll notice the main flag smasher in the show is called Carly Morgenthau she's she's literally just him but gender swapped right uh, which is between this and power broker they really this show really seems insistent on doing doing that that gender gender swap thing i'll send you a, an image of what the flag smasher looks like in the comics he runs around in a black and white outfit kind of looks like space ghost okay i was wondering like if uh because they were wearing these like hockey mask looking um they were wearing these like face masks uh all the members of the flash flag smashers wore these face masks so i was wondering yeah. if that was like uh if they were alluding okay yeah so it, i guess it was a bit of an allusion to the original flash ma flash flag smasher mask kind of sort of well and uh, their logo in the show is like a planet earth with a hand uh, over it or behind it and if you notice the original flag smasher wears a planet earth insignia on his belt uh -huh, right right i want did he ever, i wonder if he ever if he also ever said stated what was it like a uh, one earth one people i'm not sure i don't know if that specific uh catchphrase comes from anywhere in the comics or if that was just invented for the show i, I, I couldn't uh here's a more recent appearance of the flag smasher they sort of reinterpreted his classic costume and made it oh. more. He, he he looks like another captain america essentially yeah, that's the whole trend. Is let's take this classic comics character and turn their outfit into tactical gear. They did it with Batman. They can do it with anybody. Right. Uh, <laughs> I mean, heck, isn't that a, a lot of the MC of the uh, New Fifty Two? They kind of essentially did that. Uh, Jim Lee did that with a lot of his redesigns. Marvel does that all over the damn place, especially like in a post Ultimates world. You know? Yeah. <laughs> when like Hawkeye and Black Widow and Cap and all those guys, they all got like reimagined outfits. Uh, Right. In, yeah. in, in some in some cases, no capes, and in other cases, no tights. Right. And so yeah, that's uh -huh. that's the flag smasher. Right. Um. And so with the flag smashers, I thought they play they did a decent enough job at uh, giving essentially get uh, moving the plot along, help uh, a lot of help allow help out with a lot of the world building and the repercussions of the blip. 
bringing everybody back was, you know, of course, a good thing for the heroes, but interestingly caused a, mo a lot more problems uh, that we never stopped to think about. And so they are the product of some really good world building for this series uh, from what is explained in the show. At first, I was really confused at first because they don't really didn't explain uh, the motivation for these characters until like halfway through the series. Um, so like a, a, essentially with the when it came to the flags, like when it came to the aftermath of the blip or like the original Thanos snap, uh, the world was half the world's population was gone. Certain countries needed manpower in order to keep their, you know, economy afloat. So they pretty much allowed people to come in and out of whatever country, you know, they so choose. And eventually once everyone was came back as a result of Tony's actions, uh, they were saying, OK, now that everyone is back, all of you fuckers get the fuck out of our country now and leading to a lot of people who were displaced globally all around around the world with little to no support from the United Nations, which is an issue I'd say is very reflective of today's situation. Um, so you have a lot, essentially a bunch of refugees who decided to take part in um, doing what the original Sm Flag Smasher did in the comics, which was to, you know, destroy the borders, destroy the people in charge, and kind of allow everybody to roam freely around the world as opposed to being like lost between borders essentially right yeah. and they try to and they try to do that thing where you're like empathizing with the villains and you know do we do, 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 do we do we even want sam to catch them mm -hmm. and like uh you know it's a uh, i see what they're going for there but uh after they killed lamar i was like yeah <laughs> they killed lamar damn it <laughs> they killed lamar <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, for, I guess like they they were certainly as interesting as they were in concept. They I don't know I just didn't I just kind of found the main at least the main character Carlene Morgenthau a little bit on the generic side, um, only because so much of this series was like had my a lot of other aspects of this series had my attention and like. I'm sorry to say, but like the flag smashers were like the, the were like the last people on my list of things that I was mostly invested in. Like I, I cared a lot of what was going on with Sam, what was going on with, with uh, Walker. I was cared a lot about what was going on with Isaiah. So like with some with 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 uh, Zemo. So with so much stuff, even even like the, uh, uh, we'll we'll get into this as well. The uh, the. The people from w Wakanda. So there was so much going on that I could care less what was happening to Morgenthau as much as desperately as they tried to get me to care about her. Not saying she's a bad character per se. I'm just saying that there was so much more interesting things about this show that I was more invested in. Right, and at first you understand the, how she's like you know, supposed to be this really um, interesting villain with this interesting worldview and, and all that. But as soon as she goes all murdery by the end, mm -hmm. you're like, okay, yeah, see, this is this is a problem now. Yeah, even like a lot of her supporters were like, hey, man, I think we're going a little too far. And she's like, no, we're not, we're not going far, far enough. We're going to kill them all. And they're like, um, all right, shit. <laughs> And, but I do like the fact that Falcon made an effort to reach out to her in a he like he's the, he seems like the kind of person who does not who only uses force when it's ultimately necessary. He tries multiple occasions to reach out to her um, to say, hey, I know what, what you're going through. I understand, you know, but there's there's a better way. Let me help you. But there's always something that gets in the way that just fucks it up for, for everyone. Um, but I do like it. I do like his interactions a lot with uh, Carlene. And so... It was very actually pretty refreshing to see this uh, their attempt at kind of avoiding a big CGI battle, which is kind of what we ended up with at the end of WandaVision. Right. Well, at some, um, you know, when we were first introduced to the MCU version of Sam Wilson all the way back in the Captain America: The Winter Soldier, mm -hmm. um, he, we were first introduced to him as a as a. He, we found out that he uh, counsels uh, veterans. You know, he's yeah. He's got a, a mental health uh, background, and uh, they haven't really had the opportunity to expand on that uh, until uh, this show, where he sort of uh, plays therapist, not only to, to Carly, but also to, to Bucky at a certain point. Right, right. 
and uh it, it, it was that yeah that one was really great to see him like uh I love seeing the writers uh, apply the, that aspect of him and kind of, you know, use it to his advantage and, you know, help us see clearly why Steve chose him in the first place. He is not someone like, unlike Walker, he's not someone who can just, you know, he's good at kicking ass, which he is, but he's also someone who does not rely solely on brute force to solve his, his problems. Right. Uh, yeah, so... It, it, it certainly was a really good one. And it's like, uh, again, he kind of plays the middleman, sort of, when it comes to who is on the right side, who is on the who who is right, who is wrong. And he agrees with aspects from both sides, saying, like, hey, you know, we need to see each other, meet each other in the middle. You know, everyone's got issues, of course. And so, and, and he does, like, you know, point the finger a lot at the government for, since it was their incompetence that led to the... Uh, that uh, inadvertently led to the creation of the Flag Smashers, and that if th something doesn't change, another group like the Flag Smashers will eventually show up. And right, so, right. And, I want, uh, go in ahead. The, particularly in that last episode when he's giving that speech to uh, Senator Beard, mm -hmm. um, who I hated, by the way. <laughs> I, <laughs> That senator is ugh. He, he's he made he made Gary Shandling's senator from Iron Man two look reasonable, <laughs> and that guy turned out to work for Hydra. Right. Like, <laughs> this is the same motherfucking guy who took Sam's shield or you know took the shield from Sam and gave it to John Walker, and then fucking it took, it took away John Walker's benefits at that hearing. Like this is the same motherfucker. Yeah. I'm like you you have just been an asshole this whole show. <laughs> well again, which is why I'm not sure if I mentioned this before, but that's why it was like so cathartic to for for Sam to, you know, to just essentially say fuck you. <laughs> right. I wanted to ask you about that scene. Yeah. Did you think perhaps mm -hmm. that the whole that whole scene, the whole thing with Sam standing there and giving his speech to the to the GRC members, yeah. Did, did you think perhaps that it could have come across a little Preaching. heavy hand, heavy, heavy handed? handed. I was going to say. Um, possibly, yeah. Because it goes on. Oh yeah, for definitely. a while. <laughs> it felt like this was like the. It, it felt like this was sort of like the uh, those like uh, P, uh, PSAs at the end of every episode of GI Joe. Right. Listen, they kids. Spend... If you have an issue with your government, be sure to write to your government and tell them who. Tell them what's up. And remember, yeah. only no. He's. Uh, I think he even looked at a camera at one point. Remember, he only uh, knowing is half the battle. Yeah, they spend a solid five minutes of him giving this speech, and like that's fine. Captain America gives speeches. Steve was always great at giving a speech. So you found know, it's, 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 <laughs> Captain America sitting down on the chair backwards. So you end up with my shield, and now you don't know what to do. So you're in detention. No, I, I was I was more afraid to his speech at the end of Winter Soldier, but all right. But no, yeah, Cap Cap is the guy who gives speeches. That's fine. I don't know. It just felt like the whole show uh -huh. came to a stop for a minute, so that they could go, <laughs> so that they could go. Hey, all y'all, so people of the land, uh, let's here, here's what the show is about, <laughs> and then they just explained it. Yeah. Um... I mean, I, I do like it in theory, and I did like it for the most part in execution. And uh, again, he, Sam, being the reasonable guy that he is, does understand the 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 very difficult situation that the uh, politicians find themselves in, where it's like, how do you expect us to do all of this? It's like, well, not this way, but maybe we can find a, another way. Uh, right. But uh, yeah, it does go a bit too long. Yeah, you can definitely tell that they were going all out like i felt like this was more like a cathartic moment for the writers themselves and i could feel a lot of that in a good way as well um it i can it's one of those cases where i can see this being a problem for other people who prefer to have their their uh the message just not spelled out to you but it didn't bother me personally uh, as I was watching that scene unfold, just be only because I felt like this was something natural that Sam Wilson would say as someone who just went through a whole lot of shit and desperately wants to avoid this something like this happening again. Right. Yes. Uh, yeah. And I, I like the speech. I don't know. I just I've, I've seen some people say that that scene came across a little heavy handed, and I was wondering how mm -hmm. how you felt about it. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I, I do think that it, you know, it could, it could perhaps be a tad shorter. Mm -hmm. uh, 
it because yeah i mean the show just <laughs> it's literally like <laughs> the show just stops and goes <laughs> you get it <laughs> <laughs> uh, hey guys shit's a little fucked up but it can be better so america <laughs> You got detention. <laughs> now, uh, so <laughs> you got yourself a case of the Rona, and you found. So you got yourself a case of a lockdown. Uh, but yeah, um, so I'm trying to think what else we uh, we need to discuss. Oh, um, yes. so costume design for this show. This is something yes. that you wanted to t- that you wanted to touch on. Right, right, and this was. Uh, very, very much so like with uh, WandaVision, uh, this is something that you pointed out where they seem like very, very, uh, like the people over at Marvel Studios seem very intent on kind of going all out with the costume designs in terms of providing uh, costumes and suits that are far closer to the comics than they've ever been before. Um, yes, we're, well- a, we're a long way from just slapping a red overcoat on Jessica. Uh, uh, is it Jessica? Uh, Elizabeth Olsen. Oh we're, yes, yes. <laughs> we're, a, we're a long way from the days when they just slapped a red trench coat on Elizabeth Olsen and called it a day. You know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, and, and in this case, yeah, with 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 Scarlet Witch, you know, they gave her the tights, they gave her the the cape, they gave her the crown. And the case of uh, Captain America and U.S. agents, they you know went all out, giving them really great looking costumes. <laughs> Um, especially yes. when in the case of like uh, of Walker, both Walker's Captain America suit and the uh, U.S. agent suit, um, I remember you and I especially love the uh, the Star Ace emblem on his uh, cap uniform. Yeah, I love it. The A that's also a star. That's a great logo. I, I I I got obsessed with that logo after the second episode, and I started drawing it a lot. Like it's 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 a great logo. Yeah. I, I really hope he keeps using it in the future. Uh, now that he's in his U.S agent persona the only costume that is not even remotely comic book accurate is lamar they just they, uh, they just yeah. they just they just they tactical just man, gear right they just put man in like a navy blue suit and then th- threw a bullet a star vest. Did, As, yeah yeah he had a star right <laughs> There's like va- like vaguely a star on his bulletproof vest, but it's uh, not even like a full star. Yeah. I don't know, I'm sending you an image right now of what he looks like in the comics. And like on the one hand, yeah. his his outfit from the comics is ridiculous, <laughs> so it's so it's fine. Check like I didn't need right to. S- <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, I'm sorry, no. <laughs> yeah, like I didn't need to see this on screen. Yeah, but I don't know. I feel I felt like they could have tried a little harder on that one. Yeah. <laughs> Get some red at the very least up on top. Right, he's got like some red lines that go down his arms in the show, and that's that's it. I, I barely even remember those lines. Um, well, at the very U.S. Least, agent, yeah. U.S. agent costume though is really accurate. Yeah, um, and, and it's clear that they really want to emulate, like in the universe, they want to emulate the original Captain America design while also, you know, trying to update it. I feel like with this version here, it's like the most comic booky looking Captain America outfit since like the Avengers, perhaps 2012 Avengers. Cause ever since then they kind of went back and did sort of a, a combination of the more form fitting 2012 suit with the tactical gear style of the first Avengers suit um, resulting in sort of like that uh, post winter soldier uh, costume uh, which I thought worked for, for Steve Rogers and worked for the tone of those movies. Here, though, yeah, they went all out comic book style, and especially with with the, what I'll, I guess I can call the Captain Falcon suit. <laughs> yes, that is perhaps the most comic book accurate suit that they've ever done at Marvel Studios. Like, mm-hmm. it's, it's really accurate. Um, it's a little... I like the suit a lot. Yeah, they need to slim it down a little bit in the future. It's a tad bulky. Right. Uh, there, th- that was my issue at first. When I first saw the suit, it it looked gr- it looked pr- it works very well in motion for the most part. But it upon- reminded me a little bit of Arnold Schwarzenegger as Turbo Man, you know. <laughs> a bit. <laughs> uh, it, yeah, it is a little bulky and. Seeing it on screen, maybe it's the it's the fact that it's white. It's primarily white as opposed to like um, the dark navy blue 
But uh, when, when a character wears a suit like that and moves around, you can see it uh, buckling and folding a lot as the character like twists the, his body or moves their arms. And it's not as noticeable when you have a darker color, but when you have like a bright ass color like white, the, the buckling and folding of the, of the cloth or spandex material does become more noticeable. And I think that was like the most distracting part for me when I first saw this uh, costume. Like in, in still frames, it looks great. But yeah, it, when motion, I, I do agree that it, it, it doesn't work the same way that, say, Falcon's original costume worked or someone like, say, Ant-Man's costume worked or any Captain America suit up to this point worked. Um, right, right. They also had a lot of trouble with the cowl. Ah, uh, yeah. Because the cowl is shaped in such a way that uh, in real life, there's no material that can hold that shape when the actor is moving around. So uh, they actually had to spend a lot of money. Uh, well, I don't know if it was a lot of money, but they had to go in and CG the cowl so that it wouldn't you wouldn't have it like buckling and folding and like twisting just these weird, just these weird like pockets of of empty space on the sides of his face where the cowl is bubbling out you know right because uh, that's the thing a lot of comic book artists do they they draw their costumes like they're like second a second layer of skin over the care over the character so no matter what position they're in the costume never wrinkles unless you're alex ross in which case you do draw wrinkles on the costume because you're you love that attention to detail you love that kind of detail Alex Ross is is on is on a whole other level. Right. Alex, Alex Ross is in and of himself a superhuman. <laughs> I don't know. He, he's a Saiyan among humans. He really is. <laughs> but yeah, as I was saying, like like I was trying to say, like costumes certainly work in a way in comics that they cannot ever work in real life, and that is especially the case with the classic uh, cape and cowl that just like stretches over the character's face. Sc- uh, scalp and neck and just kind of like pres- stay- preserves and stays that way same goes with Not the really. white eyes white eyes generally don't really work all that well unless you pull like a uh christopher nolan's dark night dark night and just have these like little uh wh- what would you call them these like white shields o- 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 over the eyes Right, it's a it's it's a lot of wisdom that we learned in 1989 with Batman, right? Like, right, Michael where he couldn't even hold, move his neck around because they wanted to keep the shape. Or Michael Keaton has to turn his entire body to look. Yeah, the back like turn. Like, like he's Nick Fury. He's gonna like fucking no no turning, no depth perception whatsoever. <laughs> just. And, and that that, it, that that also explained why in the Dark Knight he could finally move his head around, but by that point they had to like literally segment the costume. Yeah, yeah, that's why Batman. Anytime that he's being depicted in a more realistic manner, be it movies or video games, a lot of the times it's like armor at this point. Mm-hmm. Armor Batman has become the the norm uh, for that very reason. It's just more functional. I guess the only re- only exception to the rule would be like Snyder's Bat uh, Snyder Affleck Batman. Although I'm not True. sure, how, I'm not sure how they did that cowl. I'm not sure if it was just like a solid piece of rubber cowl, or if it was like a flexible rubber material. You know what, you know what wouldn't surprise me is if it was sectional, like on set, but then they like CG'd it to make it look like it was all one piece. Like I could see them doing that. Possibly, yeah. And like how, thanks to computer graphics, we were able to finally have uh, in Deadpool the eyes moving. Oh you know? uh, yeah, yeah. You're right. Yeah, he's. Beyond, like, him and Spider-Man, they're, like, the only ones who ever really attempted to make the eye, the white eyes work. Yeah. And uh, Spider-Man Homecoming, they had a different approach to that, where they had, like, those, like, camera lens things on the eyes, mm-hmm. where he could, like, make different expressions. Yeah, I really love that. Yeah. So, yeah, overall, the, the costume design in the show, with the exception of Battlestar, <laughs> is, uh... <laughs> It's really good. I don't. I don't remember if we touched on it before, but uh, I like the way Baron Zemo looks as yes, well. Yes, the mask looks great. Um, you know, I feel like if you're going to go on a realist, because you know, it is a very silly, very comic booky, very Steve Ditko. Not sure if he designed Zemo, but it's a very, it's very indicative. It's a suit that's very indicative of '60s Marvel, and it doing it as like this sort of like um leathery mate potentially flame retardant suit uh material it does definitely works in terms of translating that mask to screen i just wish we saw more of it 
Right, right, right. But not just the mask. I'm, uh, the, his whole look is really great. I, I think I mentioned before, I want that fucking coat. Yes. And they, yes. Uh, the coat with the mask works. It kind of gives off like a little bit of like a Bane vibe with it. When You know, when Bane wore that like aviator coat a lot in The Dark Knight Rises. Right, right. And he's got that friggin' uh, the, the purple like sweater under the coat, which is great. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, he looks really clean in this show. Mm -hmm. now, if only we can see him, now, if only we can see him dance with the mask, then it'd be perfect. Now, if only he could wear a full body green suit with the big furry shoulders <laughs> and, the, and the little the little uh, dick flap, whatever those things are called. Uh, then, then it, uh, and, and, and a the crown. crown. Yes. And the crown on top of the. It's of never the enough, Dylan. 100% comic accuracy. You know? <laughs> Who knows? I think... maybe, maybe we might get him in the future. What do you think? Do you think we'll get him for the in the future? Or do you think this is the end for Zemo? The boots with the fur. I think we will get more Zemo in the future because mm -hmm. it feels like they might be building up with, uh, with like, like maybe potentially like a Thunderbolts thing, and he's a big deal. He's a big part of the Thunderbolts in mm -hmm. the comics. Uh, the Th Thunderbolts originally was a team that Baron Zemo created. He was under a uh, false identity at the time. Mm -hmm. I think he was called calling himself like is it Citizen v Citizen V or something like that. Yeah. Anyway, me, uh, 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 Mizo. <laughs> Right. Anyway, uh, Thunderbolts are kind of like Marvel's take on the Suicide Squad. What he did was he took a bunch of uh, Marvel villains, yeah. and they all they all adopted new personas and came out as this like new superhero team, mm -hmm. and it was all part of like an elaborate scheme. But then eventually they wound up actually going straight and like becoming superheroes for real. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, "Wait a minute, stop! What are you doing?" <laughs> yeah, it's like a whole it's like a whole thing. Anyway, so. Uh, if they want to go in that direction, there, there's plenty they could do with Zemo in, the, in that regard. Right, right. Uh, in fact, I was just thinking back to how uh, Baron Zemo looked in uh, Earth's Mightiest Heroes. And uh, yeah, you know, if we could get something akin to this. Okay, maybe we'll never get something akin to this. But I would say, like, you can't, as silly as the costume looks, you can make it work. <sighs> under the right kind of art direction. I'll just uh, send you an image here of what he looked like in that series. You've never seen Earth's Mightiest Heroes, I think, right? Because you weren't a fan of the art style or something? Uh, yeah, and I just, uh, at the time that it was airing, I just wasn't watching very much animated material. Uh, I, I missed out on a lot of shows from that era. <laughs> I think we can possibly make, potentially make like maybe season one of uh, Earth's Mightiest Heroes, a future episode of... Uh, a, a, a future episode of Fully Indoors. That I, I, I definitely want to show. I, in that case, I really want to show you um, both Earth's Mightiest Heroes and Transformers Animated uh, one of these days. Sounds interesting. Yeah, Transformers Animated was definitely one where I 100% I was turned off by the art style. I was like, what is this shit? You know? <laughs> look what they did to my boys. <laughs> look at all these angles. Transformers look, look can't. At all, look at all these chins. Transformers can't be this angular. How are they going to transform? <laughs> it's like they it's, gotta be, it's animation, they gotta be Dylan. Go they got to be boxes, damn it, or else it makes no sense. <laughs> no I sense. Have you seen the movies? I always, appre <laughs> I always appreciated the fact that in all the Transformers cartoons prior to that, there was like yeah. an, there was like a logic to it. Like their designs made sense, like yeah. functionally. <laughs> <laughs> Some poor bastard had to figure out how all those motherfuckers <laughs> transform. Yeah. Uh, and then, okay, yeah, it was always someone in Japan who made the toys, figured out how they transformed, and then later on you got the animation staff like, how can we make this look, how can we do this, but on a TV budget, and simplify it to where it's not so much of a pain in the ass for us? Because if you notice, whenever Optimus Prime transforms, the toy always has the wheels on his legs, but the animation model foregoes the wheels entirely. Yeah, those guys who designed those toys, those are the real unsung heroes of Transformers. Oh, fuck that, that man. Absolutely. That is some galaxy brain level shit. Yes, yeah. I'm looking at my, uh, my, my uh, War for Cybertron, Earthrise Optimus, and Siege Megatron, and they are a beaut, I gotta tell you. Uh... Okay, so yeah, well, at this point we're we're well beyond uh, uh, well beyond that, but I just uh, shared you with you uh, two screenshots or two pieces of uh, Earth's Mightiest Heroes Zemo. Oh, okay, let's have a look here. 
ah, yes, this is, um, I've seen this costume before in the comics. It's a, it's, yeah. Good choice for a Baron Zemo outfit. It's, it's a little less ridiculous than his classic, <laughs> the, the old 40s Zemo. <laughs> Where it's, it's, it's a very, like, uh, puffy, like, uh, very loose-fitting uh, outfit. Right. Did they do that thing in this show where his mask is, gets permanently fused to his face? I'm not quite sure. It, it's been a, a good long while since I've seen it. Right, because, well, there are two Zemos in the comics. There's the one that Captain America fought back during the 40s, mm -hmm. and his mask got permanently glued to his face. He couldn't take it off. Mm -hmm. And then the other Zemo is his grandson, I think. Okay, interesting. Oh, I totally forgot that there was an episode of, er, an early episode of Earth's Mightiest Heroes that did take place in World War II to set up Captain America, because that's what they did prior to Earth's Mightiest Heroes coming out. They had like prelude episodes to for each hero, and for Captain America, it was essentially kind of like their take on the first Avengers with a more uh, uh, 60s accurate comic books Zemo suit, which I just shared right now. Ah uh, yes, that's that's straight out of the old school. Mm. Look at him; he's he's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> right. So uh, they basically but, did the yeah. same thing to Zemo over the years that like uh, GI Joe did to uh, Cobra Commander. Like he starts uh, out with the with the whole hood and everything, and then they try to go on a more tactical route with his design, make yeah. him look like he could fight, and then they give him that weird reflecty helmet. <laughs> right. Right. Um, sometimes he has a reflecting helmet, sometimes he just has a, a, a blue version of the Zemo mask. So uh, who the hell knows? <laughs> yes. Uh, so, I, I am very, I'm definitely very curious to know what's in store for the future of, um, of Captain America going forward, now that we have Sam in the role. Like, I, I kind of doubt that we're ever going to see Steve again. And if we do see Steve, it's going to be in like for a very, very special occasion akin to when, spoiler alert, uh, uh, Harrison Ford came back as Han Solo for that one bit in the, in, uh, uh, the Rise of Skywalker. What? <laughs> uh... But uh, yeah, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm not sure they they set up they set themselves up for a very interesting uh, status quo, if you want to call it that, for future uh, Captain America movies. And uh, yes, which has been confirmed, we are getting a Captain America four with Sam Wilson as Captain America, written by the same guy who wrote, wrote this show. Awesome. Well, okay. Well, co-written him and another guy. Okay. Yeah. In that case, I'm I'm definitely very happy for that. I'm I really like this version of Sam Wilson, and so I am will be excited for whatever adventures this character has uh, in the future. Yes, Anthony Mackie. From everything I've ever seen of him, all the interviews and things, just mm -hmm. seems like a, del a delightful human being, mm -hmm. and that and that definitely seeps into his uh, his performance as uh, Sam Wilson. He, he's a guy that you just you want more of, you know. Right. You know, I, again, uh, I'll be honest. I was very very skeptical as to whether or not this guy can be Captain America. I mean, he he was my. The, you know, Captain America was my favorite movies out of the Avengers movies. Captain America was the Winter Soldier was the thing that even got my mom into Marvel movies. Captain America being her favorite superhero from this series. So it's I was like, you know, he's got some big ass shoes to fill and they know that. And Absolutely. overall, I dug the hell out of the series. I mean, this was a worthy follow up to WandaVision, a worthy follow up to the Steve Rogers era of Captain America movies. Um, a worthy follow-up to Endgame, um, potentially better than Endgame, because, you know, it doesn't have the baggage of trying to wrap all this shit up. <laughs> and uh, it's like WandaVision, it made me more interested and invested in the future of the MCU going forward. Absolutely. I love what they're doing with these Disney Plus shows. They're taking all these side characters who were, you know, just support, hero support, if anybody remembers Sky High. Um, <laughs> and uh, and they're fleshing them out and they're turning them into uh, main characters in their own right. First we had Wanda and Vision and now we had the Falcon and the Winter Soldier. You know, and, uh, you know, Rhodey is getting his own show. They're doing an Armor Wars show, so we'll, we'll get him. We'll get a more fleshed out version of him. We're, we're getting a Loki series next month. I mean, there's a lot. There's a lot on the horizon. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, introducing new characters and expanding on the characters we already have in this world where 
three sevenths of the original team was it seven the original Avengers team um, but see, like half, Black half those guys yeah <laughs> Like half those guys are dead, yeah. so, <laughs> dead or indisposed. Um, so yeah, yep. Not much or more can be said there, but uh, yeah, you fully endorse it. I fully endorse it. So uh, yeah, let's see what the the MCU has has next to show. Uh, what what it's got next for us? I am absolutely, absolutely. All right, man. So uh, what are you recommending for the next episode? So for next time, I will be recommending Birdman or The Unexpected Virtue of Ignorance, uh, which is a uh, 2014 uh, black comedy drama. Uh, essentially, it's sort of like one big sort of like uh, loving parody of it. The, 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 the star, uh, the star uh, uh, Michael Keaton's real life career as a former superhero actor struggling to sort of reinvent himself and ends up coming across a variety of characters as he struggles both his personal life and his professional life. Um, this was a very interesting movie that I watched way back in... Tw- it's funny to say way back in 2014, but yeah, that was like six, seven years ago at this point. So um, it was directed. I like, how we're, I like yeah. how we're sticking to the theme of bird-themed superheroes here. Ah, this is... that's right. I didn't think about that until now. But uh, yeah, I figured this was a movie that not a lot of people have talked about ever since it won the Oscar for Best Movie, um, which really surprised me. But I definitely want to uh, bring this movie, uh, you know, share this movie with you and to our audience and sort of like revisit this uh, this movie and see why it caught a lot, got a lot of attention back in the day. So, uh, yeah, look forward to that next time, ladies and gentlemen, when we cover Birdman or the unexpected virtue of ignorance. Much like this show, this movie has a lot, has big shoes to fill, even though it has nothing to do with Harvey Birdman, attorney at law, but right. still, you know, you, you, you're taking on the, you're taking on the Birdman name. <laughs> but Hey, you know, how can you go wrong when you've got Michael Keaton, Zach Galifianakis, Edward Norton, uh, freaking Emma Stone, Naomi Watts. It's a star studded cast from beginning to end. And I think we're going to have ourselves a fun time talking about it. That's a great cast. Wow. All right. I'm very excited. So, yes, tune in next time, folks. I have been Andres Perez, a.k.a. Kaiju Noir. And I've been Super Game 64. And until next time, true believers, Excelsior! Nuff said.